everyone. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to share my screen uh, for my presentation. There we go. Uh, so we're going to start off with a, a rather obvious statement, I think. Um, but yeah, the Scottish Wars of Independence were not solely fought in Scotland. Um, from before the war even officially began, the Scots utilised raids into the English North as a means of pressuring the English government and to strike a physical blow against England. The impact and legacy of Scottish raiding of Northern England during the first Scottish War of Independence, so that's the period between 1296 and 1328, has been the subject of significant study. English record evidence in particular provides detailed accounts of the extent of the raids of Robert Bruce and his commanders, the amount of money and goods taken, and the impact that such raids had on the economy and society of the region. Considerably less analysis has focused, however, on the raids undertaken by Scottish commanders during the next phase of the conflict, in particular the later 1330s and 1340s during the period that has come to be known as the Second War of Independence. In part, this is because the Battle of Neville's Cross in 1346 and the Scottish battlefield defeat at its culmination acts as an endpoint for this phase of raiding, uh, and the result of the battle casts a long shadow, which negatively affects the perception of the period that preceded it. Moreover, the relatively short duration of this reading phase has ensured that it remains a less appreciated element in discussions of this period of Anglo-Scottish conflict. I would argue, however, that these raids deserve some closer examination in order to better understand the nature, the extent, and the impact of these attacks on the English countryside during a period when English focus was increasingly drawn towards France and the commencement of the Hundred Years' War. In particular, this paper will consider the depiction of these raids in English sources and the picture that the available evidence presents of these incursions. To do so, I'll start with a brief summary of the earlier Scottish raids of the 1310s and 1320s to provide useful context for the later military efforts as well as a summary of the perhaps lesser known second phase of the war before focusing in detail on the events of the 1330s and 1340s to compare and contrast this phase with what came before. So as noted already, significant and ongoing work has been and continues to be undertaken on the raids of Robert I and his commanders into Northern England. Starting from around 1311, Scottish forces descended on the English North with regularity, but they undoubtedly received additional impetus in such efforts by their battlefield victory at Bannockburn in 1314. Hereafter, Scottish raids occurred more often, in more places, and covered an increasing amount of ground as they spread further across the North and deeper into England. No longer were these raids simply forays into Cumberland and Northumberland, but instead they entered and harried Westmoreland and Durham and extended operations further south into Lancashire and the north and east ridings of Yorkshire. The extent of these attacks alone, the basic geography involved, and the relative ease with which Scottish forces were able to mount such attacks with little opposition, reinforces the confidence and military success of the Scots in this period. The regularity and extent of these raids also reflects the abject state of England at this time, its inability to mount serious and coordinated border defence, and its nobility's lack of will to act in the name of a king many of them disliked, even when it was in their own interest. Of course, it also reflects the fact that Edward II himself was largely disinterested in and distracted from actively working to put the Scots militarily on the back foot, and when he was able to rouse himself and his forces into launching large-scale campaigns, as in 1314, 1319, and 1322, they all ended uh, in disaster, with the king himself in danger of being captured by the Scots, both in 1314 and 1322. Of particular interest in relation to the Scottish raids of this period is the impact those raids had on Northern England and its people. Again, quite a bit of work has been done on what record evidence has to show us about the financial losses, the destruction wrought, and the popular re reaction to these Scottish attacks. But to my mind, one of the most effective ways to understand the impact of Scottish raids is in their description by contemporary chronicles. 
And one of the best examples of this is provided by the Lanarkos Chronicle. Providing, as it does, a great amount of detail on Northern English and Scottish events, its Northern Providence also gives useful insight into the perception of these attacks and, to an extent, how people felt about these events. So I wanted to cite two extended passages from the Chronicle as examples of this. The first describes the events immediately after the English defeat at Bannockburn as Scottish raiders entered England from August 1314. And so on this occasion, according to the Chronicler, Sir Edward Bruce, Sir James Douglas, John Sewells and other nobles of Scotland invaded England by way of Berwick with cavalry and a large army. And during the time of truce, devastated almost all Northumberland with fire, except the castles. And so they passed forward into the Bishopric of Durham. But there they did not burn much, for the people of the Bishopric ransomed themselves from burning by a large sum of money. Nevertheless, the Scots carried off a booty of cattle and what men they could capture, and so invaded the county of Richmond beyond, acting in the same manner there without resistance, for nearly all men fled to the south or hid themselves in the woods, except those who took refuge in the castles. The Scots even went as far as the water of Tees on that occasion, and some of them beyond the town of Richmond, but they did not enter that town. Afterwards, reuniting their forces, they all returned by Swaledale and other valleys, and by Stain Moor, whence they carried off an immense booty of cattle. Also, they burnt the towns of Brough and Appleby and Kirkoswald, and other towns here and there on their route, trampling down the crops by themselves and their beasts as much as they could. And so, passing near the Priory of Lanarkost, they entered Scotland, having many men prisoners from whom they might extort money ransom at will. But the people of Coopland, fearing their return and invasion, sent envoys and appeased them with much money. Similarly, uh, in regards to the raids eight years later in August 1322, the same chronicler wrote that Robert Bruce invaded England with an army by way of Carlisle on the 17th of June and burnt the Bishop's Manor at Rose and Allerdale and plundered the monastery of Holm Cultrum, notwithstanding that his father's body was buried there and thence proceeded to waste and plunder Copeland, and so on beyond the sands of Duddon to Furness. But the, abbey, uh, the abbot of Furness went to meet him and paid ransom for the district of Furness that it should not be again burnt or plundered, and took him to Furness Abbey. This notwithstanding, the Scots set fire to various places and lifted spoil. Also, they went further beyond the sands of Leven to Cartmel and burnt the lands around the priory of the Black Cannons, taking away cattle and spoil. And so they crossed the sands of Kent as far as the town of Lancaster, which they burnt, except the Priory of the Black Monks and the House of the Preaching Friars. The Earl of Murray and Sir James Douglas joined them there with another strong force, and so they marched forward together some 20 miles to the south, burning everything and taking away prisoners and cattle as far as the town of Preston and Amundness, which also they burnt, except for the House of the Minorite Friars. Some of the Scots even went beyond that town, 15 miles to the south, being then some 80 miles within England, and then all returned with many prisoners and cattle and much booty, so that on the 12th of July they came to Carlisle and lay there in their tents around the town for five days, trampling and destroying as much of the crops as they could by themselves and their beasts. They re-entered Scotland on the 1st of August, so that they spent three weeks and three days in England on that occasion. These accounts detailing events that occurred several years apart and in quite different circumstances, considering the political situations in Scotland and England at the times they occurred, provide reflection on some key themes that I intend to return to in the rest of this paper. These include the physical and economic impact of war on Northern England and its people. Accounts such as these make clear the ease with which the Scots created devastation across a wide expanse of territory. Fire was an easy source of such, easily deployed to great effect, and when perhaps not available, resorting to the simple method of using horses and stolen cattle to trample down crops. The physical impact is also represented by the very real dislocation of people, as what were in effect refugee populations fled danger zones in seeking areas far enough removed from the Scottish reach. Many would not ultimately return to those places that they had left behind. For those who did, while well, crops could be re-sown, there was the chance of a Scottish return the following year. The Scots were also quite thorough about their destruction when money was not forthcoming, and so agricultural infrastructure was often targeted as a means of inflicting longer-term damage. Barns, some stocked with the summer's grain produce, 
and mills were burned, fruit trees were chopped down, rabbit warrens were dug up, all of which had a physical impact on both people and landscape, and which of course also led to economic consequence. This was added to by the money readily paid out to the invaders in an attempt to purchase a short period of peace and to ensure that the devastation and destruction discussed already was not visited on that particular place. But all of this took place during a period of climatic change, which resulted in widespread famine, cattle and sheep disease, and general death and want across Northern England. To these natural plagues, the Scots must have appeared like another pestilence, inflicting yet more loss and suffering on an already burdened population. And the knock-on effect of this situation was one of social dislocation and political strife, as the bonds between lords and men were strained as a result of a general lack of protection from England's nobility, and indeed from its king, to push back against Scottish attacks. The conditions in the region also allowed for greater lawlessness, and again, a somewhat deleterious approach to the prosecution of such at various times. Ultimately, this combination of factors and situations resulted in a hard to define, yet still ultimately detectable psychological impact on the people of Northern England. And I think the accounts of the Lanarkos Chronicler, um, updating the reader about each new raid, its extent, the damage done, the goods taken, seemed to become more despondent with each entry, and with the recognition that the Scots were there for the long term, with little, if any, real effort to oppose them. This all paints a very bleak picture of the 1310s and 1320s in Northern England, and it must indeed have been a bleak time. But as this paper will go on to discuss for the rest of its analysis, that period was not the end of Scottish raiding of the English North. And it's interesting to bear in mind the experiences and events of the earlier period as a point of comparison when considering what occurred later. Before focusing on the raids of the 1330s and 1340s, I thought it best just to very briefly outline how war began once more between England and Scotland in this second phase. So the treaties of Edinburgh and Northampton, which were agreed in 1328 to bring peace to the two kingdoms, were not fated to last. Peace had, after all, been agreed with the regicidal regime of Queen Isabella and her lover, Roger Mortimer, and ultimately against the wishes of the young Edward III, Indeed, the young king's displeasure seems to have reflected a more general English unhappiness at the so-called shameful peace of 1328. But Edward III could not simply overturn such an agreement without attracting the opprobrium of the papacy, and so he pressured Scotland regarding the return of Scottish lands to men and families who had lost out as a result of their anti-Bruce stance during the First War. Following the death of King Robert I of Scotland, and the succession of the child king David II in 1329, Scotland existed under a series of guardians who were limited in what they could do to placate this group of Scottish, Anglo-Scottish and English individuals known collectively as the disinherited. Edward III put more pressure on the Scots by inviting Edward Balliol to England. Son of King John of Scotland, deposed as king by Edward I in 1296, Balliol had a rightful claim to the Scottish throne. And while still ostensibly keeping his hands clean, Edward III encouraged Balliol and the disinherited in their efforts to reclaim their lost inheritance, which ultimately resulted in a seaborne invasion of Scotland by the disinherited in 1332. Early battlefield success, including a victory at Dublin Moor near Perth, resulted in Balliol being crowned King Edward of Scotland. But early success was undermined when Balliol and his troops were ambushed at Annan. Balliol fled to England and turned to Edward III for support in winning back his kingdom. And indeed, Edward III was only too happy to oblige. So when the disinherited invaded Scotland in the spring of 1333 and besieged Berwick-upon-Tweed, the supporters of David II invaded Scotland, sorry, the supporters of David II raided England to draw such forces away. Using this as a useful provocation, despite the fact that he was already assembling an army to join the siege, Edward III marched north and won a major battlefield victory at Halladon Hill, outside of Berwick. Balliol and the disinherited were free to carve Scotland up amongst themselves, and Edward III collected what he had been promised for his aid, the sheriffdoms of southern Scotland, granted to him and ruled as part of England, and that's that whole territory there on the map in the darker red. 
Edward III had brought in English garrisons and administrators to oversee his new territories and encouraged the movement of English people into the region to take up lands to make it more English and ensure its good governance. The Bruce Scots, the, the remaining supporters of David II, possessed a remarkable ability, however, to recover from desperate positions and continue to fight a war of resistance against the disinherited and the English. In 1334, rebellions broke out across Scotland and chased the disinherited out of the recovered territories. The English occupied south was raided, prompting Edward III to spend the winter of 1334-5 at Roxburgh. He returned to Scotland in the summer of 1335 with a huge army which worked to cow various Scots into submission and impose English lordship in some regions while propping up the disinherited in others. The king returned again in 1336 on a multi-pronged series of offensives, including a foray into the Highlands, which reinforced the status quo, but Bruce counter-offensives were increasingly effective and it was becoming clear that the English king's war was not bearing fruit. Retaining garrisons and administrations was expensive especially when the disinherited were not able to hold down the rest of Scotland as they were supposed to. English armies were expensive also, and though they could achieve gains in the summer, their return south left Scotland open to Bruce's counterattack, which reinforced the fact that they were not going away. Ultimately, this was a war for the allegiance of the Scottish people, and it would be, it would be won by those with the ability to demonstrate their power to consistently and effectively enforce that lordship over a prolonged period of time. And ultimately, Edward III blinked first. And although efforts followed in 1337 and 1338, they were as nothing compared to the campaigns preceding them and only succeeded in demonstrating a waning interest in Scotland by a king who was increasingly looking towards France as a more appealing target for his military affairs. In these circumstances, the Bruce Scots rolled up what was left of the disinherited presence in Scotland and pushed on into the English-held south. Raiding warfare was employed to pressure those Scots in the south to reject English allegiance and deny English administrators and garrisons revenue and supplies with which to operate. The next logical step was to take war once more into England. This commenced under the leadership of men like Guardian Andrew Murray, and later, after something of a hiatus, began once more when King David II assumed leadership of the war after his return from France in 1341. These raids mostly focused on Cumberland and Northumberland, and so mostly lacked the scale and ambition of Robert I's efforts, but they remain an important indicator of the balance of power at this stage of the conflict. The remainder of this paper then will consider these efforts to better understand their impact and to consider them as successors to those earlier raids, not just from a Scottish standpoint, but also in relation to how they were perceived by the people of Northern England who experienced them. So turning back to the themes highlighted earlier in regards to the impact of Scottish raids across the period, the most obvious effect of war in Northern England uh, relate to the physical damage caused and the ensuing economic impact of such destruction. Scottish raiding of Northern England largely exhibited similar destructive traits to Bruce raids in Scotland around the same time. English chroniclers consistently describe the actions of the Scots in terms which focus upon destruction, with the element of plunder also never far away. Although chronicle sources are invariably hostile to the Scots and their activities, the language involved in describing the raids, raids it differs little from similar accounts of English raiding in France. Lacking only the triumphalism associated with the English campaigns on the continent, Chronicle accounts of Scottish raiding remain likely to contain then more than an element of truth in their descriptions. The Scottish raids of 1333, for example, launched in response to the siege of Berwick, involved, quote, slaying and burning and carrying off prey and booty. In a small scale attack in 1337, Scottish raiders marched east from Arthurit in Cumberland, burning 20 villages, seizing a large number of cattle and also several prisoners for ransom. And all of this was accomplished in a single day. In October 1337, a raid of much grander scale than those launched previously made its way through Cumberland. Having done considerable damage around Carlisle, the Scots burned much of Allerdale and sent a detachment south to Copeland to seize cattle. Following the death of Andrew Murray, who had strongly advocated the raiding of Northern England, new leaders such as Alexander Ramsay continu continued these attacks. 
Ramsey, quote, repeatedly went to England, seized plunder, led away captives, and wasted provinces with fire and sword. A raid on Cumberland in the summer of 1346 brought, quote, slaughter and fire to that area. The Scots returning across the border, quote, with great droves of cattle. These literary descriptions of Scottish raiding are supported by administrative evidence produced for the English crown. A letter to Edward III described the 1340 raid on Northumberland. On this occasion, the Scots captured, quote, a good 2,000 fat beasts and many prisoners. Following the Neville's Cross campaign, inquisitions were set up to investigate claims made by the people of Cumberland and Northumberland that they required relief from taxation because of the damage suffered by their lands. The Inquisition found that the Scots, quote, have frequently entered the said parts and have burned and destroyed the lands, depriving the men of the county of their goods and chattels. Other examples include Robert Clifford's manor of Ellingham in Northumberland. An Inquisition of 1339 found that the manor house lay in a ruined state, that the mill had been burned by the Scots, and only a third of demean lands had been sown for the forthcoming year, quote, the rest lying waste and uncultivated for lack of tenants who had apparently fled as a result of the Scottish incursions. Ellingham was already in decline before Scottish raiding began once more in the 1330s, a lack of tenants being recorded, in, sorry, in the later 1330s, a lack of tenants being recorded in a subsidy rule of 1336. But this depressed state was only exacerbated by renewed Scottish raiding, and the manor only showed signs of recovery by around the 15th century. Other administrative accounts detail damage and destruction suffered by the estates of monastic houses throughout the English North. In Northumberland, Newminster Abbey received respite from the English crown because the Scots burned 13 of the abbey's manors, destroyed its grain and wasted its lands. Holystone Priory was granted 10 quarters of wheat by the king because its own granges had been burned. And Brinkburn Priory was granted 20 quarters of wheat by Edward III, quote, as its granges, lands, goods and chattels in Northumberland have been destroyed in the last invasion of the Scots, which was in July 1333, so that the monk's state is much depressed. In this case, the geographical scale of the destruction was possible because of the size of the Bruce Scottish invasion force, it being that the, the army that was involved uh, at the Battle of Hallerton Hill. Other raids were of smaller scale, but the destruction produced by even these could be considerable. For example, the Northumbrian lands of Nicholas Menil were raided before November 1341. An inquisition recorded uh, that at Hethpool he held three cottages, six shillings of rents, and six acres of meadow from the king, which in peacetime were worth six shillings and sixpence a year, but now nothing at all, uh, as Hethpool, quote, has been for the most part devastated by the Scots. Menil held lands elsewhere in Northumberland, at Wooler, Belford, Lowick, and Cheviot. But the lack of damage to these lands suggests that the damage at Hethpool uh, was at the hands of a small-scale incursion across the border that proceeded little further into Northumberland at the time. And further evidence of devastation in the same county appears in the accounts of the Knights of Spitler for 1338. The manor of Chiburn was described as ruined, rents were reduced because the manor lay on the Scottish march, and the total return from the manor was much reduced, quote, because the land is destroyed and much depreciated by the war with the Scots. At Thornton in Northumberland, just east of Norham, and only a few miles from the border, the impact of the war is presented in detail. Of 300 acres of arable land, normally worth six pence an acre and returning seven pounds, 10 shillings in peacetime, the value had halved to only three pence an acre by 1338. Rents worth 30 pounds when the Templars held the lands previously returned only 12 pounds, quote, because of the war with the Scots. The fall in the value of the land likely relates to wartime damage as crops were lost through burning. The fall in rents suggests that tenants had fled their holdings altogether, presumably in search of safer lands out of reach of Scottish raiders, a longer term impact from which it was more difficult to recover. Financial losses as a result of Scottish raiding led to pleas from both secular and religious communities for reassessment of or remittance from taxation. Indeed, such claims became commonplace throughout this period. And such pleas must, of course, be used carefully when analysing the extent of destruction. For once reassessment or remittance of taxation had been secured, communities often worked incredibly hard to ensure that this state of affairs persisted, whether relief remained appropriate or not. <laughs> 
as a brief example, the Abbey of Revo received a grant of £10 of Mortmain land and rent because of losses sustained through Scottish raiding in the 1320s. The Abbey continued, however, to receive rents from these lands until the reign of Richard II, even though its estates are not known to have been affected directly by Scottish raids after 1327. Instead, therefore, of looking purely at claims of poverty from English communities, alternative financial evidence is provided by the accounts of ransom payments given to the Scots to purchase safety from future damage. For the Scots did not raid Northern England only to cause destruction and deprive the local people of their goods. Far greater profit could be acquired through demands for protection money in return for immunity from destruction and plundering. And the efficient blackmailing of the English North had provided Robert IV with vast quantities of money. Similar rewards therefore were sought by David II and his commanders, and as before, English communities readily agreed to pay. The people of Carlisle, for example, purchased a truce for 300 marks in 1346 as a result of the Scottish army's appearance a few miles east at Little. A similar truce had been agreed to cover Westmoreland. To avoid Scottish attack, the people of the county paid the sum of 233 pounds, six shillings, eightpence to secure the safety of their lands. And indeed, the sum paid to the Scots was greater than the county's yearly contribution to the 10th and 15th granted to the Crown, which raised around 180 pounds in each of the two years of tax. Similarly, in 1346, David II reportedly wrote to the Bishop of Durham to demand a thousand marks or enough bread to supply his army for the duration of his campaign in return for not destroying the lands of the Palatinate. Separate agreements were also reportedly negotiated with Durham's secular landowners and indeed with the monks of Durham. The former agreed to pay specifically to ensure their lands and manors would be spared destruction and the monks, quote, promised to pay an indemnity to the Scots for themselves and their estates and tenants that the Scots should stay no longer. Where the source material provides detail of how much the Scots were able to extract from Northern English communities, it appears that the amounts were comparable to those raised during the systematic attacks of Robert I during the 1310s and 1320s. So for example, the 200 pounds raised from Carlisle and the surrounding district in 1346 is relative to the 400 pound agreed for the entire county of Cumberland in December 1314. The combined sum of 422 pounds, six shillings, eight pence from Carlisle and Westmoreland compares favorably to the sum of 400 pounds demanded from both Cumberland and Westmoreland in January 1319. Similarly, the thousand marks demanded from the Bishop of Durham, along with the separate agreements made with the Durham monks and the local inhabitants, compares favorably with the 800 marks extracted from the bishopric in 1314 and 1317, and the thousand marks paid in 1327. Still, these blackmail payments um, from the 1340s pale somewhat in comparison to the sum of 2,200 marks demanded of Cumberland in 1313 to 14. And even though Robert I received only around 1,290 marks of the sum from the county, this example is indicative of the sums demanded by a confident Scottish monarch when the Scots held a dominant military position. But I would argue that the Scots were once again militarily ascendant in the 1340s, and thus were able to extract some considerable financial gain from Northern English communities at this time. That this was not ultimately as financially rewarding in the long term is a result of the more piecemeal nature of uh, Scottish attacks uh, at this time. Interrupted by truces and then ended by Scottish defeat at Neville's Cross, the raiding of this period could not replicate the ceaseless recurrence of demands for money exhibited in the 1310s. But the ease and rapidity with which Northern English communities paid up suggests that they at least feared that it could. The consequence of the damage and loss described already uh, was reflected somewhat in Northern English society and politics. It was during the Anglo-Scottish Wars that relations between the people of the two kingdoms became, perhaps unsurprisingly, increasingly hostile and negative perceptions of the other began to develop. So in November 1336, protection was granted to Andrew Le Boyer of York, citizen of that city, who had resided there for 28 years and lived there still with his wife and children. He, however, feared that having been born in Scotland, quote, he may be injured by those that are jealous of him, 
Cynthia Neville has argued that people such as Boyer were forced to insure themselves against claims of treacherous behavior based upon little evidence other than questionable claims over their place of birth and perceived Scottishness. The level of fear demonstrated towards Scots living amongst the English population is perhaps overstated, but there is evidence of a concern at times of a Scottish fifth column. Invasion fears, for example, exacerbated bouts of anti-Scottish sentiment, and in late 1345, these prompted Edward III to order the expulsion of any Scots found living north of the Trent. English fears were at their greatest with regards to Scots residing in occupied towns. Berwick-upon-Tweed troubled the English administration the most. It was feared, for example, that the town's Scottish population would collude with the enemy to allow its capture. As a consequence, in February 1335, John Swain, John Moyne, and Thomas Dorchester were sent to Newcastle, having been arrested in the town on suspicion of association with the Scots. Two months later, the new custodian of the town was granted powers to banish any suspicious persons, English or Scottish. And these powers were utilized before October of the same year, when 20 men were released, having previously been arrested as, quote, suspicious persons. And English fears were not without foundation. At English held Roxburgh, there may even have been an attempt to overthrow the town's administration involving members of the castle garrison. In February 1339, Edward III ordered the arrest of certain men whom he was informed had been involved in a plot to capture Roxburgh Castle for the Bruce Scots. Amongst those arrested were the men Hugh and Thomas Sampson, both of whom uh, were men at arms who had been part of William Felton's castle garrison there uh, in 1336. Fears of collusion were only increased when Edward III's attentions were focused on France and Northern English nobles were left in charge of border defense. Indeed, there were even fears of conspiracy between Northern English nobles and the Scots. In response to at least three Scottish raids during September and October 1337, the Lanarkos chronicler suggested that an unnamed noble had in fact assisted the Scots. He wrote that, quote, it had been commonly but secretly reported for a long time that a certain noble in the North Country was unduly favourable to the Scottish side, and that he did on that occasion, as on other occasions, inform them beforehand at what time they might safely invade England with their army, and afterwards sent them word when they, could, uh, when they should leave it. Henry Knighton expressed similar views uh, when describing the Scottish raids of 1346. He stated that the raids earlier in the year were, quote, to the great scandal of the Northern magnates, who were believed by many to have been the Scots' accomplices in those evils and have consented to them. Fears over the loyalty of the Northern nobility uh, will certainly echo um, similar fears during the reign of Edward II. Um, but they may also have affected his son. As late as 1358 to 63, many Northern estates escheated to the crown based on claims of past disloyalty and cooperation with the Scots by members of the Northern nobility and gentry. It's been argued that, though, that through these estates and the redistribution of the same Northern territories, Edward III sought to place loyal crown servants in strategically important areas you know, to create greater stability in Northern England while he campaigned on the continent and to ensure the loyalty of his Northern nobility. For those men who were able to regain their forfeited territories, the estates were a blunt reminder that the king was able and willing to punish them if they did not fulfill their defensive duties. The resumption of Scottish raiding from 1333 played on Northern English fears of a return to the dark days of the 1310s and 1320s. And so one response to renewed attack was the payment of protection money as already discussed. Another, however, was to move goods and possessions to safety further south and away from the raiding Scots. So in late 1355, for example, um, when the Scots captured Berwick Town and laid siege to the castle, Adam Prendergast took the precaution of moving his wool and hides from Prendergast in Berwickshire to Haggerston in Northumberland for its safety. At times, the English Crown ordered the entire population of Northern England to take similar action and remove livestock to safer locations further south. The aristocracy, in particular, were at pains to ensure the safety of their horses and possessed the wherewithal to remove them to a safer location should the, the Scots threaten an attack. So in light of the renewed warfare of 1332-3, and likely in response to the Bruce Scottish raiding of the latter year, Ralph Neville sent his horses south from sites at, at Inglewood and Raby in Cumberland uh, and Algum in Northumberland 
to Coverdale in the North Riding and Evenwood in Durham, quote, because of the Scots. Even the king's own royal stud in Northern England was moved south in 1336-7, this time from Inglewood Forest to a safer location south at Nailsborough in the North Riding, and this was also done for fear of the Scots. The impact of war on the political situation in Northern England was much less pronounced than it would be in Scotland, but the reason still provided an ongoing problem for Edward III. Unrest in the North was an issue that had spilled over from the reign of Edward II, and Edward III faced difficulties in organising Northern England's defence as a result. He was, for example, forced to negotiate with his magnates at various times to ensure their commitment to border defence. Moreover, the arraying of forces in the north at times stirred up local antagonism. And this is evident from as early as 1333, when the English king summoned an army to repel the Scots. Instructions were sent subsequently to the commissioners of array in the East Riding, quote, to arrest any in rebellion there who refused to obey the king's order to muster. Similar orders were issued to the commissioners of Cumberland and Westmoreland, stating that anyone resisting their authority was to be imprisoned. Indeed, the resumption of Scottish raids in Cumberland in 1337 may have led to an additional de decline in the number of local men willing to join the king's armies, choosing instead to remain at home to defend their lands and possessions. And this prompted Edward III to send out orders to arrest any who failed to perform military service or indeed who had deserted. Although such problems affected army summonses throughout England, uh, the reaction of Northern England was particularly dangerous. If Edward III was to divert an increasing amount of time, money, and manpower to the continent, then the burden of expectation fell upon the Northerners to provide for their own defence. If they were unwilling, or indeed unable, to act, then the English king faced difficulties that the Scots were likely to exploit. Anthony Goodman has argued that English defence against Scottish raids was best performed by a series of fortified residences belonging to northern barons. Alongside the royal castles of Northern England, they provided bases for local troops who could respond quickly to Scottish action, supported in turn by men of neighbouring garrisons. If this was indeed Edward III's plan, it was not, however, always successful. Alexander Ramsay's raid into Northumberland during the Siege of Dunbar in 1338 was met by the combined forces of Robert Manners and William Heron, probably accompanied by men from their respective garrisons at Ettel and Ford. There appears, however, to have been no assistance from Thomas Gray at nearby Norham, and the English forces were defeated. Gray himself suffered defeat in 1355, when faced by a Scottish raiding force at Nisbet, where he appears to have fought the Scots divide of any support from his neighbours. And an ability to mount defence in depth is also questioned by the Scottish invasion of Cumberland in October 1337. On this occasion, the Scots were met by Anthony Lucy and men from the West March. Henry Percy and Ralph Neville also gathered troops from Northumberland to assist in countering the Scottish incursion, but they arrived too late after the Scots had retreated to successfully defend Cumberland. Indeed, the Lanarkos Chronicler was particularly critical of Percy and Neville's tardiness, especially as, quote, the leading men of Cumberland had written to them to move with speed because the Scots had sent their booty and wounded men before them into Scotland, the armed troops following soon after. In contrast to the successful muster of Northern England's resources in response to the Neville's Cross invasion, these examples demonstrate that the defence of the English North was far from foolproof. Still, this should also not be used as evidence of complete English incompetence. Indeed, it does appear that the efforts of Edward III to keep an almost constant military presence in Northern England across this period did indeed, indeed bear fruit. For example, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Scottish raids of autumn 1337, it was the local Reedsdale forces under the command of Gilbert Umfreville, Earl of Angus and Lord of Reedsdale, who apparently denied the Bruce troops uh, from achieving more than they did. However, the Lanarkos Chronicle notes that, quote, the English lingered too long for the Scots had re-entered their own land before they could overtake them. In other instances, though, English forces were far more successful in catching Bruce Scottish raiding forces often as they headed back north, laden down with their ill-gotten gains and defeating them in skirmishes that allowed much of those stolen goods to be recovered. The accounts of the animals stolen in the raid of 1340, led by the Earls of March and Sutherland, uh, was as detailed as it was, in part because much of this booty was reclaimed by the English following a successful skirmish with the Scots, led by Thomas Gray and Robert Manners. <clears throat> 
Similarly, in two of the raids led by the newly returned David II in 1341 to 2, English opposition appears to have checked the onward Scottish advance and on one occasion resulted in the capture of several newly knighted Scots after concerted action by Robert Ogle. And in cases where the Scots did return to Scotland safely, retaliatory attacks were also utilised. So in return for a Bruce raid that targeted Gilsland during the Siege of Berwick in March 1333, Anthony Lucy and his borderers raided into Dumfriesshire. Although themselves overtaken by local Bruce forces under William Douglas of Lidsdale, the English troops got the better of their enemies at the Battle of Dornoch on Solway, where Douglas and others were captured. Similarly, in late 1345, quote, certain English nobles invaded Scotland in revenge for the deeds they had endured, and having burnt Dumfries with many adjacent villages, returned to England without much gain or loss on their part. English military activity was then certainly more concerted in the later period than it had been in the 1310s. But the chroniclers comment that this latter raid at least was in revenge for the deeds they had endured renewed Scottish raiding of the region and the damage that resulted from such reinforces the fact that the English North was already feeling the effects of Scottish military effort and may already have been struggling somewhat to cope. Popular unrest was also visible in Northern England and manifested itself in various ways. There was upheaval within key Northern English towns that, although not necessarily caused by wartime events, occurred at a dangerous time as Scottish incursions of England became more frequent. There were riots in Newcastle upon Tyne, a key point of muster for English armies uh, when they headed north uh, in 1341 over the election of the town's mayor, and disturbances broke out in the town once more in 1345. In the same year, Carlisle, which Henry Somerson describes in the 1340s as existing, quote, in a state of complete demoralization, witnessed riots as well as fighting between the garrison and the townsmen. This general state of disorder was only resolved by the spring of 1346. During this period of instability, the Scots actively raided Cumberland on more than one occasion, and these disturbances affected the ability of the West March to defend itself. There were also problems, again, at English-held Berwick. In 1341, the keepers of the town gates were accused of extorting money from merchants who passed into the town, and indeed of helping themselves to some of their produce. Edward III was forced to write to his local administration around the same time to order the constable of Berwick and his ministers to desist from seizing the goods and property of merchants and burgesses, and indeed instead they should, quote, conduct themselves honourably. In November 1342, orders were dispatched that the burgesses and merchants of Berwick should no longer be retained in defence of the town, rather obviously giving away the fact that before that point they had been. The response of the English administration in Berwick only, however, succeeded in provoking further unrest for the employed uh, felons who were pardoned uh, and, and were used to provide adequate defence. This, in turn, upset Berwick's burgesses again, uh, but this time the burgesses uh, were rebuked by Edward III and ordered not to interfere with the work of the king's ministers in the town. Unrest at Berwick, like that at Carlisle, was a direct threat to the safety of Northern England, and failure to deal with it successfully only led to further concerns over the stability of the English frontier region. Unrest in Northern England was also exhibited in the apparently lawless nature of the border counties. Although a problem for many years, renewed war conditions in 1332 created opportunities for men to flout the law and escape punishment. And although not purely a border problem, the wartime situation again made such behaviour particularly dangerous for the English Crown and for the war effort. A favourite tactic employed by Northern criminals was kidnapping. And so in 1332, it was reported that Roger Kirkpatrick, himself a Balliol Scot, who had fled Scotland for his own safety, was abducted not long after arriving in England. The king ordered an inquisition to look into the matter as Kirkpatrick had been captured whilst under a royal safe conduct. In 1340, Edward III appointed Gilbert Umfreville, Henry Percy and Ralph Neville to, quote, put down the evildoers who infest the passes and woods in Northumberland and make prisoners of and rob and slay his lieges, both Scots and English. A similar commission was given to Thomas Wake of Little, Anthony Lucy and Peter Tilliel in Cumberland and Westmoreland. And in August 1341, Robert Parving, Thomas Fencoats, Peter Tilliel and Clement Skelton were ordered to, to deliver various Cumberland men to Carlisle Jail, who were accused of kidnapping men from the county and taking them to Scotland, where they extorted ransoms from their prisoners. 
And in October 1341, the Bishop of Durham and the Sheriffs of York and Northumberland were ordered to seek out malefactors who had formed gangs to capture and ransom local people, hunt them down and see that they were brought to justice. But even duties such as these were far from straightforward. And Thomas Lucy, warden of the West March, informed the king in October 1351 that he himself had been seized while carrying out similar orders in Gilsland, and he'd been imprisoned while his servants were assaulted. If the king's officers were not safe in their own localities, there was little chance that lesser men could avoid the dangers posed by thieves and kidnappers. Again, although such behaviour was perhaps not a direct consequence of the war, criminality in the north flourished in wartime conditions. The Crown's inability to control lawlessness, coupled with renewed Scottish raiding, led to ever-growing unrest in Northern England. And for the Crown, this state of affairs endangered the stability of the area of the kingdom that served as its front line in the war with Scotland. For the Northerners themselves, it appeared that the Crown was more interested in events on the continent and that Northern England was increasingly being abandoned to a state last seen during the, the reign of Edward II. So to conclude then, um, it's worth remain, uh, returning to the words of the Lanarkos Chronicle, and in particular, the depiction of the Battle of Neville's Cross, which acts as the final act of the work. Having described a litany of misbehaviour by David II and the Scots on their way through Northern England, including the massacre of English troops at Little and the sacking of monastic houses in their search for booty, the Chronicler is jubilant in describing the Scottish defeat which followed just outside Durham. Amongst this triumphalism, the Chronicler declared, quote, Praise be to the Most High. Victory on that day was with the English. And thus, through the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Cuthbert, Confessor of Christ, David and the flower of Scotland fell, by the just award of God, into the pit which they themselves had dug. Assumption that the result of battle was God's judgment on the defeated was nothing new, and considering the scale and extent of the 1346 invasion, it is difficult not to detect an element of anger amongst the chroniclers reveling in the Scots being judged by God for their misbehaviour. But it's also possible to consider that this was not just a comment on the events of October 1346, but was rather a reflection of a longer period of renewed Scottish raiding that fell squarely on the shoulders of the people of Northern England. In response, these same people had returned almost instinctively to the ways of the past. People had fled the region or moved to better defended towns and castles. Animals and goods were taken south for safety. Money was diverted from the English crown and increasingly handed over to buy peace and security from Scottish attack. And this was obviously considered a price worth paying. Moreover, the various impacts of Scottish raids discussed already ensure that these attacks, though of relatively short duration, were nonetheless keenly felt and led to a series of situations that had the potential to inhibit English ability to protect the North, in particular when Edward III and a large part of his army was fighting on the continent. Indeed, the absence of the King for long periods while war with Scotland remained ongoing and unresolved was itself a source of disquiet amongst English Northerners. Thomas Gray, the Northern English soldier chronicler, who made a career out of fighting in Edward III's wars and fought against the Scots regularly in this period, wrote of the post-Neville's post Cross uh, phase in the 1350s that, quote, King Edward was so distressed with his affairs beyond the sea that he took little regard to the Scottish matters. That such might appear the case even in the wake of a devastating English victory reinforces the fact that the Scots remained a problem without a solution and that Northern England was always susceptible to attack when the war in Scotland was not prosecuted to a satisfactory conclusion. That Northern England was arguably saved by the Scottish defeat at Neville's Cross should not detract from the grim reality that several years of Scottish raiding brought once more to the region. This is not to say that these later raids had anything like the potency, the frequency, duration, or geographical extent of Robert the First's earlier campaigns. They were less regular. They covered less distance and less of a geographical area, and they were arguably less successful as English border defence achieved a greater level of organisation. They also lasted for fewer years as Neville's Cross shattered the Bruce Scottish offensive momentum and returned the war to one uh, fighting for land in southern Scotland. But at the same time, the people of Northern England were not to know that that was or would be the case. And so for those people, there is little doubt that the return of Scottish raiding 
in the 1330s and 1340s took many of them back to those dark days of the previous decades. Thank you.